Hey guys, welcome back. Well, it's the middle of June and it's Christmas. Astrophotography Tool, as many of you know and are already using, has released its latest version 3.88 that has the much-awaited feature of a true autofocus capability. Now, it's not integrated yet into plans, but we now have the ability to perform a reliable autofocus using the uh, well-established hyperbolic fit method. I had an opportunity to use this last night, so I wanted to go through my first time using this feature, and I wanted to share with you the results I have and some of the points to keep in mind if you're about to tackle using this feature as well. I think it's an excellent addition, and for me, it worked quite well. Well, this is the setup I'm going to be using for this first test of the uh, APT autofocus routine. I'm using my Celestron C925 with the Celestron focus motor that I've had so much issues with in the past. In any event, this is the setup we're using, and one of the first things that I do when I get a focuser and put it on an OTA is do a series of tests with the Batnoff mask where I run the focuser inwards through the critical focus zone, that's the yellow band here, through the critical focus zone, and then turn around and move the focuser out to the critical focus zone, recording the Batonoff focus error that's reported by the Batonoff grabber software that I'm using. So in this case, this focuser SCT combination gives me a backlash of 20 steps. The slope of the lines also provides some useful information in that based on the slope of the line, you can come up with what you think the fine focus step ought to be. And for me and this focuser, I came up with about three to four steps as a fine step. One of the numbers we're gonna need in setting up an autofocus routine is we're going to have to enter in the autofocus step size. I tend to use about a 10, a factor of 10 on the fine step size as my autofocus step size. And like I said, the backlash is about 20 steps. This is what the uh, focus aid looks like. It's going to form the, the hyperbolic curve in here. And there are a number of options that you can select here. I'm not having it calculate backlash because I've already done that. I'm not having it calculate filter offsets because I've done that. I'm going to be using the method of the half flux diameter. The algorithm is going to be a one pass. So I'm trying to keep the number of back and forth movements that the focuser generates down to a minimum. Now over here is a number of points that will try to make up our uh, hyperbolic curve fit. I'm selected nine. It's a fairly low number, but I s sort of envision uh, one point at the near the uh, focus point and then four points on either side. And so that should give me nine points. Uh, there's a minimum number of points for the curve fit. And we'll see that uh, that uh, in the autofocus testing we did here, yeah, it had to throw out some of the measurements and uh, relied on this minimum number to, to make a curve fit. And here's that focuser move step size of 30, 10 times your fine focus step size. The maximum moves count, I don't want it moving a lot, so I'm kind of keeping it down to a relatively small number. And then there's a pause after you do a focuser adjustment because sometimes the torque generated by the focus motor can disturb the pointing accuracy of the mount and it takes a little while for it to settle back down. So I usually use about a four second settle period. And then the autofocus exposure, this is something you need to make a judgment on. You want it to be as short as possible and yet you want to uh, be able to expose a number of stars, not a, not many, we're talking just a handful and maybe just one, and you don't want to overexpose and use a saturated star for focusing. Meanwhile, you don't want it to be so uh, dim that the uh, that it is difficult to get an accurate assessment of the uh, half-flux diameter, for example. And I'm using a default binning of one by one and a gain of 139 on my ASI 1600 camera that I'm using here. This is one of the neat features of the uh, software here, which is the region of interest. Limit the focuser attention to, in this case, the middle 50% of the image. This is one of the things that I thought was uh, also very interesting as I can limit focus craft to looking at one star. There's another menu that we need to check out and that's how we deal with backlash. There are two options to deal with backlash in APT. One is where you make a final inwards move. In this case, you would set this value to a number much larger than what you uh, have measured or estimate the backlash to be. In my case, the backlash is 20, so I'm using a 40 steps. And in essence, what happens is the, the focuser, when it's moving outward, it will take an extra 40 steps and then come back in 40 steps so that the gears are always engaged for inward motion. Now, if you take an inward move, then it just moves the required number of steps. There is another way here where you can put in 
uh, the positive and negative backlash values, but these need to be really kind of precise uh, for for things to work out. I think you're better off doing this. It doesn't have to be as precise and it's very effective. The key point here is that there are some parameters you're going to need to know about your particular focuser paired with your particular OTA and the mechanical focuser on that unit. The backlash settings are over here in the APT settings menu and you can go over here to scope and focuser and that's where we put in the number of, of steps and you want to make sure not to have numbers in here. So these should be zero and then you put in a number here larger than your actual backlash. The autofocus aid is this guy here. There are a couple of methods. There's the full width and half maximum and there's the half flux diameter. The half flux diameter supposedly is a more reliable metric as you get out of focus so it's probably best to use the half flux diameter. Then the settings over here is the window we were just looking at. After you get done setting these you'll come in here and press run and you'll stand back and, and watch it do its thing and it'll plot points as it goes. As you go into the imaging mode where you're just collecting data, you can actually watch a graph of the calculated half flux diameter of the stars as each image comes in. If you go down to uh, focus craft, you can find it here and then it'll print out the half flux diameter and the full width at half maximum and then there'll be a line forming with each new image that comes in. So if you start seeing this tick up in terms of half flux diameter or full width at half maximum, then you know that it's time to do a refocus. So those are the main settings that you'll have to put in. Let's go over to a portion of the video that I shot last night. The first thing we're going to do is get this scope more or less in focus using a Batonoff mask. The one thing you want to do whenever you're using one of these algorithms for the first time in particular is to make sure that your scope is in focus. Otherwise, if you're way out of focus, it can lead to kind of some runaway motion of the focuser as the algorithm tries to find a, uh, the, the minimum or the optimum focus point and you're too far away from it. Now I'm going into one-to-one -one mode. The Batonoff mask is on. I'm going to snap a picture and see what it looks like. Yeah, it's clearing out of focus. I need to get that center diffraction spike to be in the center of the other two. And you can see we're pretty close to, at least by eye. I think that's good enough there at that point. All right, so now we can start the autofocus run. And click on the autofocus aid. We can press the run button and let's see how it works. Now remember the focus position currently is 15950. So that's where the Batonoff mask put us at a focus. And now we're trying to see where the astrophotography tools autofocus aid puts us at the optimum focus. Now you can see it's made the jump all the way out out of two out of the nine points and we have kind of a donut looking star so it's definitely out of focus it's very comforting to see see a shape that looks like it's headed towards a uh, hyperbolic curve and now based on this information here it's going to make a judgment and you'll notice that there's a red point in the list of points there that's a point that it decided uh, it would throw out it would reject and then it calculated the updated point focus point at 15857 instead of 15950 so that worked out fairly well. There's the region of interest that it was working with. So I told it to use half the sensor size and we'll take one last full frame picture. And there you have it. So the stars look very pinpoint. There's the M94, the more or less center of the image. And we're about ready to do another follow-up focus. So it's about an hour and a half or so later. Now one interesting thing here, so I was sitting here watching this, a satellite flew through in the Stellarium view right there. Now you notice this satellite is flying through right here. Now look at the pattern of stars we have here. We have these three stars here, this bright star, and then there's this right angle turn, three stars, and this offset star here, and then the bright star here at the bottom of the image. And then over here, of course, we have the uh, two guide stars. So when I saw this thing fly through at this corner of the image here, I thought, well, shoot, I'm going to go over to uh, my PhD2 guide graph and see if I see the uh, the satellite fly through and there's no evidence of it in this image. I've got the two stars and you can see here I'm using the multi-star guiding with all of two stars that I can see. So I decided to go over to uh, astrophotography tool and sure enough here's the image that we had and it runs right through here. There's those three stars. You take the right turn, that offset star, the bright star at the bottom and so it was headed right for my off-axis guider. We'll use the same settings. They work uh, really well. So all we have to do here is just press run and watch it do its thing. Now you can see we're starting out at a focuser position of 15857 from the last time we did an off autofocus run. I noticed that there are three points that it judged to be uh, outliers and so it ignored those in fitting the hyperbolic 
uh, curve parameters to the remaining six data points. And it came up with a 15811. And so there's an example of uh, having some anomalous data and the astrophotography tool algorithm uh, identifying what it considers to be anomalous results and uh, discarding them from calculation. Now, one of the neat things I noticed when I was doing this is you can hover over these points and pull out the focus or position and half flux diameter. So that's actually useful. That's the autofocus routine. It worked uh, two times out of two. There were no issues. And uh, you got to say, you're pretty impressed with that. APT is continually providing you with Im information about each image. So you have the normal information of the binning, the gain, the offset, uh, the temperature of the, of the sensor, and so on. But now with Focuscraft engaged, after each image comes in, it does an analysis of the image and gives you a value for the half flux diameter and the full width at half maximum, the number of stars it used, and the corresponding focus or position. So that's useful information that it's giving you. One of the things that I found curious is the difference in the magnitude of the full width at half maximum and the half flux uh, diameter. Those should be very close numbers. If you take if you take a look at those numbers, we call them up, you can see that we're roughly seeing about a half flux diameter in the range of about eight and a full width at half maximum is somewhere around 3.5, 3.4. I took the images that I collected uh, during this period and went over to ASTAP and did an image analysis using it. And it comes with a half flux diameter very close to what APT is coming up with, roughly in the nine range, pretty close to the number that astrophotography tool is coming up with. These numbers are measured in pixels, not in arc seconds. Half flux radius is 0.471 lambda times F. Half flux diameter, of course, is two times that. I also gave you the uh, full width at half maximum value for the theoretical point spread function, and that's 1.029 times lambda times f. You can see that the full width at half maximum should be a larger number, only by about 10% relative to what the half flux diameter is. Now, PixInsight doesn't provide the half flux diameter, but it does provide the full width half maximum. So I took those same images that I had loaded into ASTAP for image analysis and the, and the half uh, flux diameter, and here got the full width at half maximum, and I put in the pixel scale for the camera and scope I have, which is 0.35 arc seconds per pixel and said that I wanted the output to be in terms of arc seconds and sure enough when it's in arc seconds and I get a number of about 3.5 to 3.4 which is about what astrophotography tool is reporting but if I were to switch this to pixels you can see these numbers jump up to around 10 so it's it's providing the full width at half maximum number in arc seconds but providing the half flux diameter in pixels all right, so what are our first impressions and the first time use of this new and uh, very valuable feature in Astrophotography Tool version 3.88? Uh, well, the first thing you need to do to make effective use of this tool is to make sure your scope is already pretty much near focus, roughly speaking, uh, before using uh, an autofocus, any autofocus routine, because otherwise, the uh, if you're too far out of focus, it could take the data that it gets and just run away with the focuser, and that could cause some problems. So do a, uh, even if by eye and not even using a bat Batonoff mask, just get the stars to be roughly pinpoint before you uh, let loose with the uh, autofocus aid. Now, once you get going and do your first autofocus throughout the night, you'll be, you'll be fine because the focus is not going to shift that much. Uh, a second thing, uh, you got to compensate for focus or backlash. That's a must in order to get good results out of any autofocus routine. I use the final inwards move option. I think it's probably a more reliable way of accounting for backlash than using specific values for inward backlash and outward backlash. You don't have to be as precise, and it just gar it's guaranteed to work. It's always going to leave the gears engaged for one direction of motion inwards. You want to use a large enough step size in order to see the hyperbolic curve. Sometimes you'll put in a number you won't know what that large step size should be. There are two pitfalls here. If you use too small of a step size, you may find that you just get this rough looking line. It doesn't seem to have a curve to it. That's because you're you're operating in and around the, the critical focus zone and there's not enough of a curve for it to identify and pick out a or fit a hyperbolic curve so it can find the optimum focus point. That just means you need to set the points 
uh, the step size larger. I use about 10 times what the fine step size is. I suppose if you went too far, you, the outer points could lose all characteristics of a star. They might be too faint for, to be detected. The algorithm might fail to, to recognize uh, that you have a star out there. So there is a, a sweet spot. Um, but I really like APT's features that they've included to restrict the assessment. So you can focus the field of view down to a the center of the view of the, of the uh, image so that you're not subject to some image aberrations around the corners. You can also limit the number of stars it uses. One of the things that happens a lot with uh, a long focal length system is that you get these aberrations during the autofocus routine where a, a little gust of wind will, will cause a star uh, to appear more like a streak than a, a point. And it in turn causes problems for algorithms designed to look and calculate the half flux diameter, for example. So you're going to get these spurious results, and a real test of any algorithm is how well does the algorithm handle these spurious results. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, when spurious results were generated uh, with my SCT, the algorithm fought through it, identified the spurious data, threw it out, and did a calculation for the half flux diameter that looked quite reasonable. And so I thought it did extremely well. That's that's a must if you're going to have a robust algorithm that you're going to let uh, run overnight unattended. So uh, kudos to them for, for implementing something that appears to be quite um, robust. It would be nice if they would store the actual half-flux diameter and focuser position pair data for each focuser run just for diagnostic evaluation later. Sometimes there's going to be a, a case where uh, the spurious results uh, dominate and it'll be difficult to know what happened because you won't have any uh, evidence of of how the decision or how the calculations were performed and I think uh, particularly for a new feature like this and for something that's as critical as this it'd be nice if all of that data were stored so that we could get back to it and see it uh, the next morning to see what happened. Nothing's wrong with the code as it is, but it'd be nice to report the full width at half maximum and the half flux diameter in the same units, either pixels or arc seconds. Finally, it would be good to place the uh, limits on the maximum uh, plus or minus focus or movement to prevent it from going too far outside the bounds of where focus ought to be. Finally, I want to say a big thank you to the folks, Benny, Steve, and Jim, who really showed a great deal of collaboration and initiative to uh, implement this algorithm and and work with the developers of APT to get this thing in to the most recent version of APT. So uh, I think they deserve a big uh, round of applause. And next time you see them in the pub, buy them a beer. They deserve it. Okay, guys. Well, that's about all I've got for today. And clear skies, and I'll talk to you guys later.